When you, when you acknowledge that there's a very real invisible realm that affects what comes to pass down here, it reframes everything. And it began to completely uh, redo my, my thoughts on the problem of evil. All right, without further ado, let's bring up Greg Boy. <laughs> Thanks, man. Hello, everybody. You have the looks and the sound of a, of a DJ, if ever there was one. Let's bring out Greg Boyd. <laughs> hey! No, that's great. Let me start with a word of prayer. I could. Abba Father, we are here, uh, God, just to think your thoughts after you. At least that's our heart's aspiration. We believe and help us uh, understand our belief, our faith seeking understanding. And God, so we, we just here submit our minds to you. Uh, we don't get our life from thinking that we're right on everything. We get our life from knowing you. Uh, but out of the fullness of that life, we want to think correctly, uh, to be able to present um, a true perspective on the world and on you to people who desperately need it. And so, Lord, give us clarity here. Uh, give us freedom to disagree. Give us freedom to think. Give, give us freedom not to know. Give us freedom, God, to uh, cling to you as you've revealed yourself on the cross as our only source of life and to let go of everything else as an idol if we're to cling to it. Let your spirit baptize us in this room in your love and in your wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Amen. You know, Rolf Winter, the first time I uh, ever had any contact with him, I think it was around 98 or so, I could be wrong, but uh, he had just read God at War. Um, and uh, he was talking about um, his wife's illness. Uh, and uh, I think at this point she had already died. Uh, but had talked about how he was reframing everything, his, his perspective of the world in terms of, of this cosmic war. And the thing that really is so impressed me, I don't know how old he was at this point, but he wasn't a spring chicken. Uh, he, he, he was up in years. And here this guy is, I'm imagining he's in his late 70s. Is that about right? In, in 98, how old would he have been? 98, 99? Uh, how old was he? 74. He was 74. Uh, okay, so he was 74, 75 years old. And he's trying out a new paradigm. Or I'm, I'm sure it wasn't totally new. He's, I'm sure there's an evolution that, behind that. But it's so cool that, I, I, I mean, here he is. This, in my experience, what I've seen is most people tend to get more rigid as they get older. And by the time they're 50, <laughs> there's no new thoughts allowed. Uh, and here he's open to new paradigms and thinking out loud and exploring new ideas. And uh, it could very well be, I don't know, but it may be that the, those, the, the writings he gave in the last 10 years of his life may be the, the most uh, powerful in terms of his, his legacy, his impact. Uh, some of his speculative ideas about uh, how to integrate uh, a warfare perspective with, with evolution and the Cambrian explosion, all those sorts of things. I don't know, but it's a model. It's a, it's a model for all of us to always be thinking. To never think we've got a corner on the truth. To always be open to new ideas. Always be, uh, always to be learning. Always be exploring. And I found that people, uh, your, your personality and your type tends to uh, attract and it selects in and selects out certain personalities. The, the, the people tend to gravitate towards another. They have kind of a like-mindedness. And uh, so it's not surprising to me that as I get to meet people here uh, who are coming to this conference, um, there's. Generally speaking, I don't know all of you. Uh, for all I know, maybe some of you are incredibly narrow-minded. I don't know. Uh, but, but my impression so far is that there's an openness. It's like, uh, you know, there's some environments, I'm sure a lot of you have been in them, religious environments, where uh, there's a fear of, of having a new thought. Uh, and and it, it's, it's, it's a fear-based sort of a, a culture. Uh, I don't sense that here at all. It, it is a willingness to explore and to... Uh, uh, we know that what has been said hasn't been working. Let's try out some new things. Um, and that, I think, is, is, uh, is a credit to uh, Rolf Winter. Uh, it, it's, it's what he was, was all about. And so it's in that spirit that I hope we can conduct all of these discussions. Um, it's just been fun. 
even this morning at breakfast talking to Richard, uh, and I don't know, it's some new book ideas coming out. This, this, this uh, Lord just let a lot of fruit come out of this conference uh, that could maybe be used to uh, change some people's minds on some stuff. Okay, so the, I'll be giving three talks today, and the general outline will be something like this. I plan on, in this talk, and probably carry it over a little bit into the next talk, uh, we'll talk just in general about the warfare worldview and giving a biblical foundation for this. And this, I know, is going to be a review for a lot of you. Uh, but I find that this material, no matter how much you hear it or how much you teach it, it, it comes back at you. It, 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 there's a new dimension you get out of it. Yeah, I don't think you can... Uh, there's so many old tapes that we got to redo that uh, you can't get too saturated with this, I don't think. So uh, I'm not afraid of, 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 of being, uh, for some folks, maybe a little repetitious. Uh, it's important review. So I'll do the biblical material first after giving an outline of the, the general warfare worldview. And for some of you, maybe completely new. I don't know. Uh, and then we'll look at, start to move into the early church and the way they thought about the problem of evil. Uh, and, and then I'll talk about um, what I call the Trinitarian Warfare uh, Theodicy. Uh, it's basically the material I give in the book Satan and the Problem of Evil, the six theses of that, that theory. And then in the last section, um, I want to talk about the uh, virtually infinite complexity of a war-torn creation and why we can't know why. Uh, but how, what matters is not why we can't know why, but we at least know the kind of problem we're dealing with. In other words, the, uh, I want to argue that the, the mystery, we can't ever know why any particular evil happens the way it does, or any, why, why any particular good happens the way it does. The world's too complex. But we can know the character of God. It's, it's, not, it's not God who's mysterious. It's, it's the creation. Um, God has revealed himself, and he's a very good communicator. If people will listen and dare to believe that he's as beautiful as he reveals himself to be. Uh, so God, God we know. God's purpose, his character we know. Uh, what we don't know is are the, the innumerable variables that condition everything that, that come to pass. So having said that, let's jump into this. The warfare worldview. First, a word about waking, the importance of waking up to the war. This is what I shared last night. Uh, I held something like a warfare worldview prior to 1987, in that I believed that there were that Satan was real and that there were demons, and they they had some impact on what came to pass. I was actually at that point in a transitional stage in my theology. And I, my friend Clark Pinnock says you should always call yourself a pilgrim uh, in, in theology because you've never arrived at the destination. Always be learning. That's that Ralph Winter spirit. Um, and so at that, at that stage of my life, I was kind of transitioning out of Calvinism into the view that I hold now. Uh, people are always surprised to find out that I was once a Calvinist. Uh, but I was uh, from about 82 to 84, 85, and then 85, 86, 87 was the transition years. Okay, kind of murky and... It's crazy, but, um, but it was only after I had that experience that I shared last night, and then several years later, four experiences in a three-week period of time, that I think I actually woke up to the reality of the war. Because it's one thing to believe something theoretically. It's quite a different thing to have it be on the, the, the radar screen of what you register as real. It's only what you register as real that impacts the way you actually view the world and then the way you actually live in the world, the narrative that you live in. And so the challenge is not just to get people to believe the right things, but to somehow help them have an experience or have something get adjusted so that they actually experience a different world, a world in which the spiritual realm is real. I think that's a profoundly important thing uh, for a number of reasons. One is this. Uh, only, we, we can only hold to God's beauty. Oh, it doesn't. Come on, come on, baby. There we go. Seeing God's beauty. Um, God reveals himself to be, in the person of Jesus Christ, uh, uh, an unbelievably, unfathomably beautiful, other-oriented, agape love, self-sacrificial, enemy-loving deity. Uh, Burst apart all the things that human beings have ever thought about God's greatness. Uh, God's greatness is found in the person of the crucified Messiah. Radically unexpected and unspeakably beautiful. Uh, I didn't see this one coming. Paul says that for us, 
Uh, you know, for, for the world, the cross is foolishness and weakness, but for us, it is the power and wisdom of God. Amen. It is, I think, a revelation that is so beautiful that uh, few theologians in church history actually could accept it. So when we came to defining God's power, or God's wisdom, or a lot of other things, we tended to rely on Plato and Aristotle more than we did on uh, the, the God's self-revelation uh, on the cross. It's an incredibly beautiful God. Uh, an enemy-loving, self-sacrificial God. The trouble is, is that uh, we live in, as you may have noticed, a very crusty world. A world that is sometimes, uh, people undergo nightmares. It, the reality of this world is that it is a world in which a good portion of people experience a nightmare from which they cannot escape. It's a world in which the Holocaust does occur. A world in which kids get kidnapped and the parents never know what happened to them. A world of unthinkable evil. And you'll be able to hold on to God's beauty, the breathtaking beauty revealed on Calvary, only to the degree that you can understand that evil originates from some source other than God. Amen. Otherwise, you're going to loop God's character in with all of the evil of, of uh, the creation. Uh, if you hold to a classical view of uh, omnipotence as omni-control, there is no way to distance God from all of the garbage that goes on uh, in this, this fallen world. And people, you, you, people can assert that uh, certain things happen in creation that reflect God's will, but not God's character. That's a, a, a theological point that is often made, that God wills evil, but his character isn't, isn't involved in the will. Uh, God's character is all good, even though he wills evil for a greater good. Uh, but when you are on the inside of the pain of the world, and you maybe are the first-hand recipient of the nightmares that it sometimes dishes out, or a loved one is the recipient of the nightmares it dishes out, uh, some of those fine-tuned distinctions that theologians are so inclined to make become quite meaningless. Uh, ordinarily, we define a person's character precisely by what they are, what they will. You'll know my character by what I will. And so if the Holocaust is in some sense, and the, every kidnapped child, every raped child is in some sense part of God's will, that can't help but reflect on God's character. And so part of the importance of waking up to the warfare worldview, I think, is that it empowers people to hold, to preserve God's breathtaking beauty in a world that is breathtakingly evil. Um, it's it's uh, the uh, only way to do it, so far as I can see. And uh, hanging on to God's beauty, is in, 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 especially when you're in the midst of evil, is all important. That's your lifeline. And the tragedy is that, depending on your theology, if you have a theology that associates God with the evil that you're going through, people are going to be more inclined to push God away precisely when they need Him the most. And so there's a pastoral aspect to this, uh, preserving God's beauty in a world that can be very, very ugly. The second thing has to do with resignation versus revolt. You know, it's, it's interesting, but if you study uh, theology and the philosophizing of the ancient Stoics, you'll find a kind of piety there that is very close to the piety of many, uh, if not most, Western Christians. It's a, a piety of resignation, where the goal is to accept what you cannot change, um, and to see, accept, embrace as good what you'd be inclined to think of as evil. The ancient Stoics were determinists. They believed that everything was, in general, they believed that everything was, was uh, determined by the Logos, which was sort of the mind of the world. They were pantheists, thought everything was in some sense God, but the Logos was the mind of God, and that, that determined everything. And so there was, in the end, no free will. And so everything that happened was necessitated. They were the ancient fatalists. But their form of piety uh, was, was to uh, embrace with a calm resolution what you cannot change. That was the goal of their piety. And so what you find in, in many Christian circles, especially those that are more inclined to embrace a determinate, uh, determinative view of providence, is um, a theology of, of resignation. Whereas I submit to you, that the piety that the New Testament offers us, calls us to, commands us to, is not a piety of resignation, but a piety of revolt. Precisely because we're not fated and we can change what comes to pass, at least within limits. 
So for example, a number of years ago, there was a guy in our church who uh, came down, a 27-year-old man, uh, married, had two young children, uh, came down with brain cancer. Uh, the doctors said that there's very little they can do for him. Uh, they're going to send him down to the Mayo Clinic uh, to do some uh, experimental uh, stuff with him. But the, the night before we went down to the Mayo Clinic, we uh, called the church together, and we don't believe it's God's will that a 27-year-old man, father of two, uh, die of brain cancer. That doesn't seem like God's perfect plan for his life. Uh, we, we, we believe we're called to declare war on that, and so we did. And we had a four-hour prayer meeting where we just barraged that brain uh, with prayer and did you know, spiritual chemothe chemotherapy, if, if you will. Just bombarded him with prayer. Um, the next day, I was at a, another meeting, uh, a faculty meeting, an academic institution, uh, where they asked for prayer for one of our faculty who was diagnosed with having breast cancer. The prayer that was prayed in response to this request was, Lord, we don't understand your will, but help us to embrace with a sense of peace that which we cannot change. Uh, we know all things are part of your will, and so on and so on. See, the prayer we prayed on Sunday night was a revolt prayer. The prayer that was prayed on Monday afternoon was a, uh, a, a, a prayer of resignation. It was a stoic prayer. Now, the person in our church, he, he called me up. He went down on Monday to the Mayo Clinic. On Wednesday, he called me and he told me, he goes, you won't believe it, but they can't find any sign of any cancer. <laughs> And they, they say that there must have been a misdiagnosis. Uh, there must have been blah, 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 blah. Uh, someone made a mistake because these, you know. But um, that's, I think, just their very understandable attempts to explain what otherwise can't be explained. You see, Jesus said, pray this way and live this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Which presupposes that God's will is not being done on earth as it is in heaven. That's why we're to pray and to live so that it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That involves a theology of revolt. And so one of the reasons why it's important to wake up to a warfare worldview is that we're called to revolt against a lot of stuff. It changes how you fundamentally live. If it really gets on the inside, it changes how you fundamentally live. I often illustrate it this way. Um, suppose there's a family who that wants to take a vacation and they happen to have a, a, a nice cottage they own a cottage on a beach in France Normandy France and um, they're, they're gonna take a nice vacation and on vacation it's understandable that you want to just be free of problems you want to avoid all conflicts any troubles you want to uh, have as much comfort as possible as much convenience as possible as much fun as possible live the good life and, you know just kick back that's normal that's what you do on vacation but this vacation unfortunately happens to be planned on June 5th 1944 <laughs> And so they go to the vacation home and they're kicking back and having a good time and trying to avoid all conflict and have as much comfort and convenience as possible. When all of a sudden the next morning on June 6th they wake up to gunfire all around them. And it turns out they're caught in, they're right in the war zone. Uh, the German, German uh, forces on the hills up there and the U.S. and Canadian European allies are coming in on the boats out in the ocean. And so they get a call from their commander and it says, hey, listen, we understand you've got a cottage there. We're going to need to use that and we're going to take our wounded there. You're going to have to help with this warfare effort. Uh, this is the turning point of World War II and you need to, uh, you know, get, get involved. Um, well, see, the day before it was totally appropriate for this family to kick back and look out for number one and want to have as much comfort and convenience as possible and avoid any kind of conflict and trouble. That's what you do on vacation. But the same mindset that was appropriate on June 5th is inappropriate on June 6th when you find yourself caught in the middle of a war. It becomes immoral to act like you're on vacation when in fact you're in war, if in fact you are in war. Right? It becomes unethical. Um, so also, we're conditioned in the Western world where we created sort of an oasis that uh, at least to some degree blocks out much of the hardship that the rest of the world has to endure. But we can create the illusion of this being a vacation resort. It's called the American Dream, and most people try to live the American Dream. They uh, want to live life as free of problems as possible. 
with as much comfort as possible, with as nice a house as possible, as nice as clothes as possible, the finest food as possible, with as much prestige uh, as possible, driving the finest cars as possible. Um, it, it's, it's life in Disney World. And that would be wonderful if it was Disney World. But when you realize that we're caught in the middle of a cosmic conflict, there's a war going on, and we are all called to be part of this war, that mindset becomes immoral, unethical. It's going AWOL. Because if you're in a state of war, then everything has to be rationed for the war effort. The war trumps everything else, right? And, um, and so uh, if, if you're living with a vacation mindset, you're going to be inclined to, when problems have to strike and you avoid them if, at all costs, if, if, if you can, uh, the, you, there you just try to resign yourself to it. But when you understand that, in fact, this world is a war zone, and that's not just a, a metaphor, it really is a war zone. And that this, the Earth is like the Normandy beach of World War II. And for whatever reasons we can't discern, it has to do with the complexity of the war, this Earth became the stage in which uh, way more than human beings were at stake. There's a cosmic battle going on, and humans have a vital role to play in this. When you understand that, well, it changes how you spend your money. It changes how you spend your time. It changes how you buy things. It changes the kind of questions you ask. Yeah, you no longer, as I said last night, you no longer ask the typical American question, which is, do I want it and can I afford it? Because in the normal American mindset, if you're conditioned with the consumerism of our culture, which is one of the demonic strongholds of our culture, every culture has got us demonic strongholds, consumerism is, is uh, the, uh, one of the strongholds of the West. But there you only ask the question, do I want it and can I afford it? And then the assumption is that if you can answer both of those yes, then you get it. Well, you have a right to it. And you would if this was Disney World. You would if this was vacation. But it's not a vacation. We're in a war. And so the question to ask is, does Abba want me to have this? Does my enlisting officer want me to have this house or this car or these clothes or this food? Uh, am I living where I'm supposed to live? It, it, when you wake up to the war, it brings an intentionality to your life that wasn't there before. Uh, if you have a vacation worldview, well then Jesus becomes part of your vacation. You got the good life, and then there's Jesus on top of it. It's like he, he's your fire insurance, and he's there to make your life a little nicer. He'll even bless you, and we've Americanized Jesus, so he's here to help us get even a bigger house, and a better car, and nicer clothes, and, and so on. Um, but when you understand that there's a warfare going on, then, then there's an intentionality to your life where uh, Jesus, uh, as your enlisting officer, permeates everything you do, everything you think. Now, Paul said in uh, is it 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy 2.4, I think it's 1 Timothy 2.4, that the good soldier does not become overly involved in civilian affairs, but is always seeking to please his enlisting officer. And so Paul is thinking of a Roman guard uh, stationed in Palestine. A Roman guard stationed in Palestine, you know, they occupy Palestine. Um, a good soldier would never forget that you're not Palestinian, you're not Jewish, you are, you are Roman, and you're here to carry out your assignment. You're on duty. And so you wouldn't get so involved in civilian affairs that you forget that you're a soldier on duty. So also, if, we're, if there's a real war going on, we understand that our job is to please our enlisting officer, to always have our walkie-talkies on, to always be doing his will. That's the only thing that matters. And so uh, we're not to get so involved in civilian affairs, into the, the politics of this realm, this, this, uh, this territory that we happen to find ourselves in, and act as though we belonged here, as, this was, as though this, was, this earth uh, in its present condition was our natural home. It's not. We understand that we're ambassadors of the kingdom of God, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, our job is to put on display an alternative kingdom, a different kind of kingdom. That's how we do warfare. And, uh, and so the question we always ask is first and foremost, Lord, what is your will? Not my will, but thine be done. And if it is God's will, well then you will be able to afford it and you will want it. Or if you don't want it, well then you'll get yourself to want it because you realize it's God's will. And your job is to get your will to line up with his will. All right? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It changes the, the, the narrative you live in. Whether it's a consumer vacation narrative versus a... Uh, Kingdom warfare narrative makes all the difference in the world. And then the final reason why it's important to wake up to the uh, warfare worldview is it has to do with making sense out of our world. How do you make sense out of this bizarre, bizarre creation we find ourselves in? Which we believe was created by an all-powerful God, an all-good God, 
And yet, it is, as I said a little bit ago, as you all know, it is afflicted with hideous, hideous, sometimes nightmarish evil. How do we make sense out of this? And people have different registers in terms of how much sense any position needs to make before they believe it. People are wired differently, and I think that's okay. For some of us, the register is very high. Um, for some of us, our heart can never get on board with something that our mind doesn't have satisfactory coherence on. Um, I'm wired like that. I suspect many of you are wired like that, which is probably one of the reasons why you ended up in a lecture like this. <laughs> uh, you, you, you weren't satisfied with uh, the, the status quo answers that, that you were given. Um, so the credibility of the gospel to some degree hangs on this. I think to a large degree hangs on this. How do you make sense of an all good, all powerful God creating a world in which we find ourselves in where there's nightmarish evil? Um, I shared last night how I began to, after reading the myth of Sisyphus uh, in a cafe in one, uh, one day, blowing off all my university classes looking for the meaning of life, um, how that, that began me on my trajectory back to God, that there must be a personal being out there that corresponds to, to me. Uh, either I am profoundly in sync with the way the universe is or I'm prof profoundly out of sync with it. Uh, what's the nature of ultimate reality? If it's personal, well then we're at home in the universe. If it's impersonal, then we are freaks in this universe. Uh, and you can't explain why we're freaks. <laughs> it's it's an unintelligible, absurd, irrational, and very painful uh, position to hold. I actually admire the people who can live it consistently. People like Nietzsche and Sartre. Uh, I, I, it takes incredible courage to live out that absurd existence in a consistent way. But in the process of coming back, one of the last things I had to get clear on was the problem of evil. And this actually, the warfare worldview isn't, I don't think, the last word to be said about the problem of evil. I think it's an important word, but it's not the last word. The last word has to do with the cross. And it's that, that God himself suffers the evil that has come about uh, in his creation. And, um, and I, I, it was a hurdle I needed to get over. I'll just share, you, share this. I, I was... It happened in 1977, this October night, as I'm wrestling with this, trying to believe again in a personal God, uh, not yet in Christ, but, but, but in a personal God. And um, I was at the time really impacted by the problem of evil like I had never been before. Uh, as some of you may recall, uh, in the fall of 1977, there was this uh, a television series on the Holocaust that, that they, they, sh they showed. It was uh, a dramatization, and it was powerful. Uh, this is also when uh, Sophie's Choice had come out. One of the most hard-hitting movies I'd ever watched in my life up to that point. I'd still say the same at this point in my life. Where this, it has to do with this, the demonic horror of the Holocaust. And I was learning Hebrew. And so I was taking this class with, uh, uh, it was the all pond class, an immersion sort of a, a thing that I started in the summer, where most of the other students in the room were Jewish. And some of them were talking then about how they, their parents or grandparents were survivors of the Holocaust. So my world was very much Im immersed in the Holocaust. And I have ever since been sort of obsessed with the Holocaust. It just strikes me as uh, a, a paradigmatic kind of an evil. But then we were studying the moons. I, I, was, I also had this astronomy class, and this one evening, a cold October night, we were on the top of one of the buildings at the University of Minnesota and taking turns looking through the, these telescopes at the moons of Jupiter. And as we were doing this, the professor, who was a, an atheist and was proud of that, um, was uh, talking about the Big Bang and how all the, you know, this, how the, all this came to be. Um, and I was just overwhelmed by the magnitude, the awesomeness of this universe. Uh, you know, 13.7 billion years old, they estimate, and just the expanse and the billions of stars. And of course, now we know, just in the last 10 years, it's five times uh, more populated with, with uh, stars than we previously knew. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, and I suspect that that will be updated uh, exponentially in, in the future. But it's unthinkably large, and the design of it, and the magnitude, I was thinking there's got to be a God. I remember turning to this professor as he's pontificating about uh, how all the matter of the universe uh, could have been super condensed into this uh, very tiny point uh, that would have been uh, fit into a thimble, he was saying. And um, it was so super condensed and then it exploded. And um, I asked him, 
as he's talking to this class around us, um, where did the thimble come from? <laughs> and why did it explode when it exploded? Because that, if it wasn't always exploded, that means something must have changed. Right? If you can't get something from nothing, there must have always been something. And if something new happened, something must have changed. Otherwise, it would have always been like that. And so I asked, where, where did the thimble come from and what caused it to explode? And he, he kind of giggled as though that was a dumb question. And he says, at some point, uh, you just, at some point, you've got to stop asking questions. <laughs> and I, I, I remember thinking, Oh, okay, so, so this is a faith gig here. This is a faith gig, and that's, that's fine. But if you're going to have a faith gig, then you can't criticize someone else's faith gig. Something's got to be eternal here. <laughs> if, if, there, if you can't get something from nothing, and apparently there is something, there must have always been something. So now it's just a question of what is the something that always was. Amen. And matter doesn't seem like it's a very good candidate. Because everything about it seems like it's winding down. Uh, which makes no sense unless it was first wound up. And, um, and you can say, well, you can't ask questions before the moment of the Big Bang. You know, this is Stephen Hawking's thing, uh, that time begins with the Big Bang, so you can't ask what happened before it. That doesn't work! Not if you're using a verb. <laughs> if there's a verb, a verb is, is there, it was this and now it's this. So if, if there was a Big Bang, there was a before the Big Bang. Sorry. <laughs> That's my simple brain talking. Uh, so anyways, I walk back from this, this, this uh, uh, lecture on this um, uh, building, uh, looking at the moons of Jupiter. And on the one hand, I was so overwhelmed by this, uh, the grandeur of the creation and thinking there's got to be a personal God. All the reasons I gave last night. You know, the longings of my heart, there must be an answer to them. If I long for meaning, there must be a meaningful ultimate reality. If I long for morality, there must be a moral ultimate reality. If I long to make sense out of things, there must be a rational ultimate reality. There's got to be a God. On the other hand, I was thinking, how, how could a God who can create this universe and this brain and, and this kind of design surely could have kept Sophie from having to make that choice of which one of her two children is going to be sent to a death camp. Surely could have prevented that uh, from happening and all the other atrocities uh, of, of world history. So there can't be a God. I refuse to believe that there's a God. But what about the magnitude of the universe and the longings of the, for rationality and morality and, 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 and purpose? There must be a God. Yes, but what about uh, kidnapped children and raped children and, and the wars and the, the plagues and the disasters? There can't be a God. Yes, but what about the magnitude of the universe and the longings for rationality and morality and purpose? There must be a God. Well, there can't be a God, but there must be a God. Now it's like a ping pong match going on in my head. There can't be. There's got to be. There can't be. There's got to be. There can't be. There's got to be. I was just walking back to my car that night. My brain was just going back and forth. I was like, Ha! Ah. And then the, the moment that turned it around for me was, and I don't know if there was something I read that planted this idea, I, I, I don't know, or if it was just a revelation, but I remember I, I was I, I, at my car, uh, out in the parking lot at the U of M, it was a cold October night, and I just was opening it up with my head going in this ping pong match between there can't be, there's got to be, there can't be, there's got to be. And I in part thought and I in part said, and I can't parse out which is which. But I basically thought and said, with a, quite an anger, that if you're up there in a comfortable heaven looking down on this miserable hellhole that you created, looking at this poor miserable race of people where mothers have to choose which of their two children is going to be gassed, um, then I have a moral obligation not to believe in you. I have to um, join the ranks of Sartre and Camus and Nietzsche and say that uh, in the name of humanity I refuse to believe. And I think that, uh, I hesitate to say this, but I, I believe it, so I might as well be a lot about it, that I, I think God would find something admirable in, in that. I think there's something laudable about a person who, for, out of moral integrity, says I can't believe in a God who does immoral things. Amen. I sometimes wonder uh, who will be better for. That's not my business to know. But would God rather have a person who, the only option was a God who does immoral things and they say I must for moral reasons be an atheist. Is that better or worse than the person who 
out of a lack of moral integrity says, oh yes, I'll call you good even though every moral fiber of my being says that you're evil. But uh, if you say you're good, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't want you to trounce on me and uh, I'll believe in you. I wonder how much, how much faith is really uh, sort of a hangman's uh, theology where I, I'll say what you want me to say even though I don't really believe it because I don't want to find myself on the outside. I don't know, I just wonder which is uh, better in God's eyes. In any case, I, 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 I said and thought up to the, the vault of heaven, if you're out there looking down and you're comfortable in heaven and, and that's it, then uh, I have a moral obligation not to believe in you. The only way I can believe in you is if you are on the inside of this hellhole that you have created. If you, are, if you know what it's like to be the mother that has to choose, if you're on the inside of that experience, has to choose which of her children is going to be gassed alive. If you're on the inside of the nightmare of a parent whose uh, child never came home and has no idea every night if they're being raped in some sicko's basement. If you know on the inside what it's like to be the kid who didn't get chosen by the mother and now is being brought to the gas chamber. If you're on the inside of the horror, then I can believe in you. And as I got in my car and was turning on the engine, the light bulb went on and the revelation was, uh, what do you think the cross is all about. See, that is the ultimate answer to the problem of evil. It doesn't explain it, but it gives you a picture of God or whatever else your explanation is, and I think we need to have it. It shows you that God is on the inside. The cross is a God who is on the inside of the human nightmare. And it's the only theistic system in the world that, that posits a God like this. A God who would dive into our hellhole. He takes responsibility for all the evil of the world, even though he's morally culpable of none of it. Uh, that's what the, 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 the cross displays, and that's the beauty of, of, of God that I'm talking about. All right, good. Um, and, uh, and so th th that displays the beauty of a God who, out of love, enters into the nightmare of our human existence. Now we want to show, as best we can, why he's not morally culpable for it. And that's where the warfare worldview comes into being. So we've got to make sense out of this world. And so the rest of this lecture, and actually the rest of the next two lectures, are about integrating the warfare worldview in a way that makes sense out of uh, the, the world that we find ourselves in. So here's the problem of evil. And I'm sure this is not new for, for a lot of you. Um, basically says this. It has a lot of different varieties, a lot of different forms. This is its most basic version. If God is all good, that he wants to prevent evil. What does it mean to be all good other than that you're against all evil? That would be the very definition of what it is to be good. If God is all powerful, then it seems he is able to prevent evil. What does it mean to say that a being is all powerful other than that you can do whatever you want? So the very definition of being all good means that you're against all evil. The very definition of all power, it would seem, is that you're able to do what you want. And so it would seem, oops. Oh, it would have been the third datum, however, and this is the problematic one, is that it seems evil exists. It's very hard to look at this world and say that it doesn't. Uh, so something has to give here. Um, either an all good and all powerful God does not exist, these are your only two logical choices. Or evil does not exist. There may be a God who's all good but, but not all powerful. There may be a God who's all powerful but not all good. Or there may be no God at all. Or evil doesn't exist. And surprisingly enough, the church has tended in its classical tradition to go to option uh, B. As I'll show here in a moment. But that's the problem of evil. That, that's what we're, we're, uh, we're dealing with. Now the, the classical theology of the church... It's called classical because it's the dominant theology throughout church history. And I'm painting with very broad strokes here, and people could nuance and all you want. I got that. I just understand I'm painting with, with, with broad strokes. But this is the gist of what the classical view is. It holds that there is a specific, good, divine reason behind each and every event that comes to pass. Okay, there's a specific good divine reason behind each and every event that comes to pass. So history is the working out of a, a meticulous divine blueprint. That's why I call it the blueprint worldview. Everything that happens conforms to an eternal blueprint in the mind of God or in the will of God. If I had time, I could show you that there is uh, a, a long heritage in the Hellenistic philosophical tradition that's behind this particular perspective. Um, <coughs> 
I don't think its, it's ultimate origin is in scripture. Uh, it, it has some deep Hellenistic uh, philosophical roots, but we'll have to pass on that for right now. If I live long enough, I'll get this third volume in my trilogy done called The Myth of the Blueprint. Uh, it's, it's now 11, 12 years o uh, overdue. Uh, and <laughs> I'm not making very quick progress. I keep getting distracted. ADD, uh, what do you do? You know, too many interests. So um, that means then that every evil is part of God's good plan. And in the blueprint worldview, if there's a specific divine, uh, it, it, the reason we go like this, and it's quite straightforward. If every evil that comes to pass could have been prevented by God if he had willed it. That's the assumption. If he's all powerful. Every evil could have been prevented by God if he had willed it. But B, since all that God wills is good, it must always be good that evil was not prevented. It's very straightforward. God could, the assumption is, prevent every particular evil that comes to pass. Whatever God does is good, since God is all good. Therefore, if God doesn't prevent a kidnapping, a rape, a holocaust, a mudslide, an earthquake, you name it, it must be good that it wasn't prevented. Because God's all good and He always does what is good. So everything has to be for the best. Everything's part of God's good plan. It's pretty compelling, uh, pretty compelling argument. And so you can understand why uh, people have embraced this classical perspective. And ultimately it means then that evil, what we call evil, has got to be simply uh, an epiphenomenon. It, it is, it, it's a, a perspectival thing. Evil is evil to us from our perspective, but not to God. And that's not just an inference. You can find, if you read deep into the theological tomes of the classical tradition, uh, theologians who it, it say this very thing. So here's St. Augustine in his Confessions, where he says, For you, Lord, evil has no existence. And not only for you, but for your whole created universe. Because, see, God's perspective is ultimately the true perspective. Our perspective is limited, and therefore it's prone to illusion. It's, it's limited. And so we can say evil is real to us, but ultimately the true perspective says it's not real. And so he says, not just for you, but for your whole created universe, because there is nothing outside creation that can come crashing into it and so disrupt the order that you have imposed on it. Why? Because God's all-powerful. And God can do whatever he wants. So what could there be that would disrupt his will? He gets whatever he wants. Yet in parts of your creation, there are certain things which are thought to be evil because they don't relate harmoniously to other things. That's how he defines evil. But there are still other things to which they do relate, which makes them good, and in fact, they are good in themselves. St. Augustine has his, this famous um, uh, mosaic analogy to illustrate this point. He says, imagine a, a large mosaic painted uh, on some uh, large canvas. Uh, which is full of various colors and complexities. Uh, the painting as a whole can be very beautiful. But if you stand too close to the mosaic and look at just one dark spot, you wouldn't say it's beautiful. Any particular dark spot is ugly considered in and of itself. But if you can step back and look at the, how the dark spot plays into the whole mosaic, well, then you can see how it contributes to the beauty of the whole. So also, Augustine says, and this is the classical tradition, the dominant way of explaining evil throughout the classical tradition. There are things which, if you look at them in and of themselves, are ugly. We call them evil. A, a kidnapped child, a mother who has to choose which child's going to be gassed, a person being buried alive, a person being tortured in unthinkable ways. Uh, those are things that are not beautiful in and of themselves. And so we call them evil. But we only call them evil because we don't see how they blend in with other things. And how they make the whole more beautiful. And ultimately, for Augustine and the classical tradition, the ultimate criteria is the glory of God. God is glorified somehow by these evils uh, in creation, which are ultimately not evil because they contribute to the beauty of the whole. 
a, uh, a painting that has dark spots uh, combined with light spots is more beautiful than a painting that was all light. Or uh, one analogy that uh, Augustine uses in his work, The Enchiridion, is he, he says, a, a, a poem that is set apart with exquisite antitheses is more beautiful than a poem with less striking antitheses. So also a creation that is, uh, brings beauty out of evil is more beautiful than a creation that never suffered evil in the first place. Now among the problems with this view, and I think there are many, but among the problems is this. Uh, people are not paint pigment. And what, uh, the, the analogy I think fails at the precise point where it needs to explain. Um, that it, while it's right to, to treat paint pigment with exquisite contrast and words with exquisite contrast, to use a person, a sentient being, and to set them up to suffer a nightmare for the good of the whole, as I would submit to you, immoral. Amen. Especially when you could do otherwise. Um, say to the mother who has to choose which of her two children will be gassed. Well, I hope you realize that this contributes to the beauty of the whole. Uh, I would think the mother would have a moral obligation to uh, reject that, that greater good a line of defense. Uh, the, best, the best argument against this perspective I've ever read in my life is uh, Dostoevsky's uh, uh, dialogue between Ivan and Eliosha and the brothers Karamazov. If you've ever read that, what, Dostoevsky, what he did is he compiled over three decades uh, actual accounts of uh, sufferings of children that he came upon in various news uh, outlets and he put them in um, he had a priest Eliosha who is arguing with his brother Ivan the atheist and uh, the question at, at hand is uh, wait, so what is that is that how much time I have left or how much time I've gone or what is that <laughs> oh it's always going down oh boy, I gotta hurry up um, I haven't even started I haven't even broached it yeah okay good oh that's going that way all right now now he tells me now he tells me now I gotta start over <laughs> God, I, I got that. It's reading the clock backwards. Um, but uh, uh, so uh, the, I, I, Alyosha is, is arguing for an Augustinian greater good defense, and Ivan just rips into him, uh, giving account after account. It's hard to read. It goes on for like 20 some pages of the sufferings of children. And he makes the case that it's immoral. Uh, if, if, if God is using children, the suffering, unthinkable suffering of children uh, for the beauty of his whole, then he's an immoral be being. And I think he makes a very good point. So the, 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 the challenge then is this. Well, he, he, here's the alternative to this. It's the warfare worldview. And the warfare worldview holds that there's a multiplicity of wills that affect what comes to pass. And all evils all ultimately originates in wills other than God. That's the, the, what I call the warfare worldview. And as I show in my book, um, A God at War, the warfare worldview, it's not limited to, to a biblical worldview. You find this in almost every culture throughout history. It is the, the dominant view of primordial cultures. They, there's this, uh, a basic intuition that there's a number of agents in the spiritual realm that affect what comes to pass, and some of what we're afflicted with is due to the activity of those agents. And there's a number of other features of, of this warfare worldview as, as, as well. Um, the rub of this will be, and we'll get to this in, in the next session, or at least in the session after that. Here is the rub of this, is that uh, at least the, those of us who hold to a biblical version of the warfare worldview still want to be able to say that God is all powerful and all good. The catch here is to be able to render intelligible a statement about an omnipotent God not being able to do some things that an omnipotent God would like to do. To be able to say, God can't do certain things. You see, in other words, the assumption that I want to argue against later on is the assumption that an all-powerful God can do everything he wants. Um, I, I, I'll suggest that that has to at least be qualified, uh, depending on, on what that God wants. That we, as long as you're saying that God simply won't intervene to stop an evil, you're going to be stuck with a blueprint worldview. You can't avoid it. If God just chooses on a case-by-case -case basis, I will intervene, I won't intervene, because I don't want to, well then, because God's all good, you're going to have to say it's good that he didn't intervene. So the catch is to be able to render intelligible a belief in an all-good, all-powerful God, and yet 
construe matters such that God wants to intervene, but he can't. And that will be the, 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 the issue to, to press in on other, uh, here in a little bit. All right, so let's um, enter into the, the uh, biblical material here. I'm going to give a very, very broad overview of, uh, this is just a uh, brief snippets of, of what was covered in the book God at War. And I'll look very quickly at the Old Testament, and I think we'll have to quit then. Uh, and then uh, when I come back in the second session, I'll pick up with the New Testament, and that's when it starts to get juicy. But here, here's what we find in the Old Testament about the warfare worldview. Um, and this is easily missed because the way the Old Testament talks about evil is not the way contemporary talk, people talk about evil. Unless you have some teaching on this, you're going to miss the main way the Old Testament captures the warfare worldview. Um, even though the thrust of the Old Testament is to, in the face of all of Israel's polytheistic neighbors, the Old Testament wants to drive home the foundational truth that there's one God who's the creator of all, who's sovereign over all history, and that things don't happen because of the conflict of the multiplicity of gods out there. There's, there's one God who's over the whole thing. That's, that's the, the, the main thing that the Old Testament wants to drive home. So it doesn't emphasize the warfare nearly as much as we're going to see it, does, it happens in the New Testament. Still, you'll find in the Old Testament a m much more on the warfare worldview than people realize. And the reason is because the language it uses is simply not the language that we, we, we use today to talk about these things. So, for example, the dominant way, if, if you can read that, the dominant way that the Old Testament talks about evil has to do with hostile waters. You read all over the place um, uh, statements about God rebuking or pushing back or controlling or taming the hostile waters. And how the, the waters raged and the waters rebelled and all this kind of stuff. One example is Psalms 104 where it says, At your rebuke they flee, referring to the waters. At the sound of your thunder they take flight. They rose up to the mountains, ran down to the valleys, to the place that you have appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass, so that they may not again cover the earth. Now the thing is that um, we've got a lot of literature in the ancient Near Eastern world to compare the, Bib the Bible, uh, biblical literature to. And so we know that the role, in fact, some of the songs that we find, some of the hymns that we find in the Old Testament are almost verbatim quotes from other ancient Near Eastern literature. It's just that where uh, the, uh, the Canaanites, Ugarites, Mesopotamians, uh, they would attribute to uh, Baal or, or Marduk or some other deity uh, the power that rebuked the hostile waters and, and slayed Tiamat and forces of chaos. Uh, the biblical authors take those same songs and they attribute them to Yahweh. Kind of like the, the, the Wesleyan brothers would take some of these bar tunes and, and, and Christianize them. Because they were con, you know, converting all these, these drunks on the street. And so they just would take the bar tunes, these are the songs the guys knew, and they would uh, supply Christian lyrics to them. You know, and can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died he for me? Oh, that, that originated as a bar tune. And you can kind of hear it, can't you? It sounds like a Bartoon once you realize that that's what it was. <laughs> I got so drunk, fell on my butt, my old lady was, I was in a rut. Da, da, da. Well, that, that's, what, that's just what the, the, the Old Testament authors are doing this. All their neighbors are singing these songs about God rebuking the waters. They just say, no, it wasn't Marduk, it wasn't Baal, it wasn't any of your deities, it was Yahweh. But we know that it was their way, they believed that the earth was surrounded by this personified water. And it was always threatening the earth. And there's a lot of reasons for this, having to do with the role that water played and, you know, in the ancient world. Um, but um, they always were saying it's Yahweh that has to push these, these forces at bay. Um, sometimes they're portrayed as, oh, another one is, when the water saw you, oh God, when the water saw you, they were afraid. They were uh, the very deep. Uh, to home trembled. Um, uh, this isn't the way we think about evil, but it, it was their way of saying, uh, like when Paul says, Satan is the principality and power of the air. He's basically saying Satan is, is, permeates our atmosphere, our environment. This is an ancient Near Eastern way of saying there's hostility in the very environment of the earth. And Yahweh has to always keep the, the, the waters at bay. Now, they're very sure that Yahweh can do that. And that's the main thrust, is to say that we're not insecure about this. You know, God is greater than all the gods. God is greater than the waters. They're always saying that. But, and here's the important point, 
far from minimizing the authenticity of the power of the waters, their praising God presupposes that the powers, the reason why God is great in, in saying that He can rebuke the waters is because uh, the waters are actually powerful. And so the, these ancient authors are saying there are mighty, powerful, powerful forces that engulf the earth, that perpetually threaten the earth. But God is great because as powerful as these waters are, God is greater still. And so but in their own way, they're articulating a warfare worldview. And when we come back, I'll just in one minute summarize uh, other ways that the uh, Old Testament expresses uh, this, this hostile environment of the earth. And then we'll get in the New Testament where they up the ante considerably. Um, okay, so that will bring us to this point. We'll take a 15-minute break, and then we're going to have a panel discussion. All right, see you in 15.